I'm Brian Pitts. I was wondering, uh, is there anything to say about why gravity couldn't have been a, a, a massless or even massive spin zero? Uh, it's true that massless spin zero particles uh, could give us long range forces. Um, that uh, massless spin zero particles could give us long range forces that, mit, that are roughly look like gravity, they would give us orbits and stuff like that. They would in detail be different, that they wouldn't give rise to bending of light. You know, as, as I'm sure you know, that there, was a, there was this theory of Nordstrom's from 1913 uh, that was a nice predecessor to a GR that impressed Einstein enough to get worried about. So, that's, I mean, it, it gives rise, classically it seems fine. Classically it gives rise to things that are gravity-like. Uh, quantum mechanically it's very hard to make sense of. Uh, for precisely the same reason it's hard to imagine that the Higgs is so light. Spin zero particles want to be heavy, therefore, uh, if they were naturally heavy, as they would have to be if they had the kind of interactions that would give rise to things that look like a long-range gravitational force, then, um, then they wouldn't give rise to, they wouldn't give rise to uh, actual long-range forces that, that, that they'd be screened. So ultimately, because of quantum mechanics, there's a very good reason why it can't have been uh, spin zero. You can have massless, conceptually, you can have massless spin zero particles, but they don't mediate inverse square law forces. They mediate inverse cube law, inverse fourth power law, higher, higher, uh, 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 higher powers, and, uh, and um, anyway, they, they, they don't give anything that looks like orbits, planets, nice bound states, things like that. And sorry, and it, uh, what I said is still true, that even without looking at the world around you, um, uh, the theorists locked in the room would conclude there's something damn special about spin two. <laughs> that if it exists, there's only one of them, and it has all the properties that are those of general relativity. Uh, without ever talking about falling ele elevators and curved space-time and all, all the rest of it. Okay, that's, uh, that's the way Einstein discovered it, but it didn't have to be the way th things happened. Jeremy Butterfield, thank you for a splendid lecture, but I, I think you said that three times in the last hundred years yes. a, a dynamical explanation had been provided that avoided yes. a fine-tuning, but I think you only gave the I, I classical one. electron. Yeah, yes. Could yeah. I just, what were the two others? Sure, then? there are two others. Um, one of them is almost identical to the Higgs problem. Um, and uh, I, I gave the classical electron because it's probably more, more familiar. Th these ones, you, you'd have to you know, know, know about pions and things like that. But, but, uh, but if you take the pion, uh, so you probably know what the pion is. So, you, you, uh, so there's a charged pion and a neutral pion. And the charged pion is a little heavier than the neutral pion. Um, but, uh, and we have a very good understanding for why the pions are light, actually. Uh, but, uh, but exactly the same kind of quantum, I mean, literally the same kind of diagrams, exactly the same effect that we worry about with the Higgs, you could uh, worry about for the charged pion. It would naively make the charged pion infinitely heavier than the neutral pion, okay? Um, literally the same argument. So you say, ah, some new physics has got to come in not so far away. You make an estimate for where it should come in, and it should come in by 1.2 giga electron volts. You should have a new particle with mass less than 1.2 giga electron volts in order to solve the problem of the charged pion. Okay? In fact, new physics does come in. It's called the Rho meson. It's at 0 0.77 giga electron volts. Once again, it comes in earlier than it has to to solve the problem. Okay? So, and that's a literal analog. I mean, uh, uh, and then there is another famous example from the development of the uh, uh, standard model of particle physics in the prediction of the mass of the charm quark. So this is something even more uh, esoteric, but, uh, but the properties of, of the AK mesons, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a mass difference between two different states of the uh, K meson. That mass difference, once again, gets a divergent correction from quantum mechanical corrections that are more and more violent at higher and higher energies. So you predict that a new particle should come in at some mass scale in order to cut it off. Um, and, uh, and the charm quark was a particle that was designed to do that. You make an estimate for where the charm quark should be, it's 2 GeV uh, uh, in order to do that, and it came in earlier than that. So those, those are the th three instances. Wonderful message. Um, quantum theory plus special relativity equals both the need for the universe and the impossibility of the universe, but I just put it to you that the mere fact that you've got a spin-2 boson on a Minkowski space-time is never going to give you the kind of uh, pathology that arises in a quantum GR where the manifold structure itself is likely to disappear. No, you actually see that. You, you, you actually see that directly from, from, from these arguments. Th these arguments not only tell you, these arguments not only tell you uh, that at sufficiently long distances or, or sufficiently low energies, um, uh, 
uh, we have something that necessarily has to look like GR. It also tells you that the picture has got to break down as you go to higher, uh, as you go to uh, high energies or sh short distances. But not this isn't a problem with renormalization difficulties. No, no, uh, no. The, the manifold the, structure itself. Well, uh, so uh, in a sense, uh, the, um, this is a, a long discussion we, we could we could have, but. But in a sense, the, the manifold structure is all in our head, um, and uh, and if if you're really if you're sort of very hard nosed about the actual observables, we can we can talk about. I mean, all the usual difficulties that we talk about with uh, with the manifold structure and, and the short distance problems of uh, of the gravity, um, uh, you can you can uh, formulate them in the language of talking about the scattering of ordinary particles, particles like gravitons, electrons, photons. Uh, as the energy gets comparable to the Planck scale, and that has the advantage that it that it turns it into a real, instead of it, instead of it being this sort of uh, fuzzy wuzzy problem with a manifold breaking down, we don't know what it means. It turns it into a sharp problem. Okay, and the sharp question is: you collide two gravitons at an energy five times the Planck mass. What happens? Two gravitons come in. What comes out? Right. You know, if you're if you if you know what's going on in physics, you should be able to predict the amplitude for anything to happen. And this is independent of your formalism or what you think is going on with the manifold, whatever it is. I don't care. You, you do the experiment, you fire the gravitons in. I can fire them at 100 M Planck if I want. Something happens, they come back out. W what happens? Predict that probability, that probability amplitude. If you take exactly this inevitable structure I told you about and exactly the thing that makes it powerful at long distances make it fail at short distances and at high energies. And the answer is, you just can't do it. You can't write down a formula. We don't know the formula. It's, it's as simple as that. If someone comes along and hands you a formula that tells you what the probability amplitude is for any number of particles in to any number of particles out at any energies, including energies comparable to the Planck scale, they've given you a candidate theory for quantum <coughs> gravity. Regardless of whether they talk about manifolds or this or that and the other, it's a sharp output that any such theory should give you. If someone comes along telling you they have a theory of quantum gravity that doesn't give you a formula like that, you should be very suspicious, okay? Because that's something that every such theory should give you. And, uh, and anyway, so it really comes out of these arguments. So I'll ask you for, if you could think of an example of something. Suppose that we think that small quantities are natural if when we set them to zero, the symmetry of the problem rises. So the right. 10 minus 5 anisotropy of the universe is natural because when we set it to zero, the universe is more s symmetrical. But the 10 to the minus 120 of lambda is seriously unnatural because when we set it to zero, the symmetry of the problem goes down. You know, we're no longer in maximal symmetric space. Can you think of an, another example where that would work? Can you think of an example where setting a small number equal to zero makes symmetry go down? Well, I, I, in that case, it actually doesn't make it go down, right? That the, the size of the de Sitter group and the Lorentz group and the empty de Sitter group are all, all the same. So the symmetries are different, but uh, yeah, we, so we have maximally symmetric solutions in all cases, right? Oh, perhaps you're, perhaps you're talking about the, 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 the FRW universe yeah, versus the... About no, that's true, symmetry. right. Uh, the short answer is not off the top of my head, but uh, the slightly longer answer is that um, there's a very good reason, as, as you know, why, especially in, uh, in, uh, in, in high energy physics and particle physics, why do we talk about the vacuum all the time? Um, why is the world close to the vacuum? The world is close to the vacuum because of cosmology, right? It's, it's a wonderful fact about cosmology that, uh, that, that, it, that it dilutes things, it, uh, it slows things down, it brings things close to the vacuum. It's a really deep fact about the world that we have the kind of cosmology which does this and which brings us to a vacuum state. So, uh, so I think in fairness, if, uh, because of that, um, uh, it, it's fair even with lambda equals zero to talk about the asymptotic future where, where you open up into a flat space. And then you have flat space to sitter and anti to sitter and they're not distinguished. That's one way of talking about the difficulty of the cosmological constant, is that there's no distinction, there's no symmetry distinction. You don't gain any or lose any symmetries in the maximally symmetric solution as you pass through zero. So, uh, and I didn't spend long enough uh, uh, talking about this, but you might think, okay, this naturalness idea fails radically for the cosmological constant. Maybe there's some other dynamical principle we haven't thought about yet, right? And that's entirely possible. It's possible there's some principle that uh, no one has thought of yet. But all kinds of word level ideas don't work. And um, for example, one idea that people like to say a lot is, oh, it's not that the cosmological constant is small, it's that like gravity is modified on very long distances in a way that somehow the big vacuum energy doesn't gravitate, it doesn't curve space-time. 
And this is one of many ideas that are really a non-starter as soon as you try to make them more concrete. And it has to do with relativity again. It's hard to modify things just on large distances without also modifying them on large times. And it's hard to modify them on large times in a way that does anything to the cosmological constant problem without modifying it in the future and violating causality. In fact, it's almost a theorem that you can prove that if you have a modification of gravity designed to solve the cosmological constant problem, it must be a causal. It must know what's coming next. And that's because a little region of the universe that has some energy density in it, matter, radiation, and cosmological constant, it can't possibly know which part of its energy momentum comes from the vacuum energy, and which part comes from radiation, and which part comes from matter. The only thing that distinguishes the vacuum energy part is it's the part that survives into the deep future. So the only way to modify things in a way that sort of removes the vacuum part would have to modify things in a, exactly, would have to foresee what, 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 what is coming. So, so people have tried. I, I think you, 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 you'll find that the physicists who are most sympathetic to the anthropic explanation of the cosmological constant problem are the people who have banged their head against the problem of solving the cosmological constant by conventional means the hardest. <laughs> okay? and, and the people who tell you you're giving up and you're not and you shouldn't uh, do these things and it's not science are the people who haven't actually tried to solve the problem very hard themselves. Uh, yeah, but there, there's lots of mechanistic explanations like that that just don't, don't, don't work. Um, there's another aspect to these problems, which maybe I'll just say quickly, uh, which is that it could be that uh, nature, that the actual, you see, part of this idea that we shouldn't have fine tuning is, is the picture that uh, we're making an estimate for how big these quantum corrections are. And it's an estimate, note, that's getting bigger and bigger as you go to smaller and smaller, higher and higher energies, smaller and smaller distances. So it's pretty unreliable what the actual estimate is, right? We don't know what's going on at very, very small distances. But we have the idea that it's sort of, we can ballpark estimate what it is, that we're not going to get a dimensionless number coming out of the problem that's 10 to the minus 50 uh, out of nowhere, right? Um, but it, it's conceivable. I mean, pure mathematics does do this sometimes. <laughs> pure mathematics does hand us out of questions that don't have any big or small dimensionless numbers, answers that have uh, enormous uh, dimensionless numbers coming out of them. So, um, you know, uh, it, it, it's very easy to write down a simple math problem just involving no numbers bigger than two, you know, looking at modular functions in the complex plane. Uh, and poof, out of it comes a number 196,884, right? That's a big number coming out of a tiny, uh, out of a problem with no big or small numbers. If we knew some way to convert the calculation of the mass of the Higgs uh, in some complete underlying theory in a way that utilized this fact and produced out of nowhere these large numbers, then, then that would be an example of it. That would be a counterexample to this idea of naturalness. Okay? It's just that no one has ever found such a thing. Um, these, these naturalness questions become very sharp uh, in a context where you find a bigger theory, not just the standard model, for example, but a bigger theory where you can actually calculate the mass of the Higgs. Um, in the standard model, you can't calculate it, nor can we calculate the vacuum energy. That's why we can, we, it's not a calculable thing. Um, that's why we say we, 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 we just measure it from experiment. We balance quantum against classical, we just measure it from experiment. But you might imagine a bigger theory where it is calculable, and in that bigger theory, every such bigger theory anyone has ever thought of, you can see just in front of your eyes exactly the fine tuning that you worry about <laughs> from the bottom up. Okay? So that's another thing that gives more credence to the idea that there is something to it. Because you try five, six, seven different possible bigger theories in which you can embed this where these quantities become calculable. And in every such theory, you find precisely, calculably, sharply, the tuning that you suspect from the bottom up uh, arguments. But if someone came along with a theory which managed to put these enormous numbers uh, or, uh, in, in, in front of these estimates, then, then that, that, would be, that would be one way uh, around them. So I stress again that, that this problem, the naturalness problems, are not like the problem of, for example, quantum gravity. They're not like the problem that we talked about a second ago, that if we collide gravitons at very high energies, we just don't know what's going on. We, I mean, there it's not a question of something looks funny, your parameters are funny, just the, the laws break down. We don't know what's going on. That's a real problem. That's a real physics problem. This is, may or may not be a real physics problem. And the idea of naturalness is at the moment a guide for what to expect. Uh, but it's not by itself a principle of, uh, of uh, physics. Okay. Thank you.